Welcome to Israel Now News. I'm Yochanan El Rome. And I'm Rebecca Rand. In our top story, we begin with some good news. The Jewish state is reporting more positive statistics on the effectiveness of the Pfizer vaccine. Jerusalem continues to provide the immunization data to the public in the most organized and widely available campaign in the world. To date, more Israelis have received the vaccine per capita than any other country. Maccabi, one of Israel's main health care providers, announced that there have been zero coronavirus-related deaths among recipients of both doses, and they are reporting a 93% rate of effectiveness. Another Israeli health care provider, Klalit, has found a 94% drop in symptomatic COVID-19 cases for the vaccinated. The healthcare providers stress that immunity can only be achieved seven days after receiving the second Pfizer vaccine. Senior Maccabi official Dr. Miri Mizrahi Ruveni said the data unequivocally proves that the vaccine is very effective and we have no doubt that it has saved the lives of many Israelis. The Biden administration is demanding that Jews refrain from building in the Jewish heartland of Judea and Samaria. In what is being viewed in Israel as a double standard, the White House wants Jews to cease constructing homes and infrastructure for their citizens. This while turning a blind eye to illegal Palestinian building in the area, allowing them to put facts on the ground. Ned Price, the spokesperson for the U.S. State Department, made this shocking announcement. The policy would in essence mean that the Biden administration is supporting the creation of a Palestinian terror state within the borders of Israel. Price also criticized Israel for demolishing structures illegally built by Palestinians, calling it a unilateral step that exacerbates tensions. He noted that the Palestinian Authority should cease payment stipends to the families of terrorists, a policy which has made it illegal for the United States to provide aid to the PA because the money is used to incite and reward the murder of Israeli and American citizens. The United Arab Emirates has sworn in its first ambassador to the Jewish state. This past August, former President Donald Trump negotiated the Abraham Accords, which resulted in the recognition of Israel by several Muslim and Arab states in the Middle East. Jerusalem recently opened its embassy in Abu Dhabi, and last month the UAE cabinet approved the establishment of an embassy here in Israel. Mohammed Mahmoud al Kaja was sworn in by Dubai's ruler, the vice president of the United Arab Emirates, Sheikh Mohammed bin Rashid al Maktoum. The Iranian-backed Houthi rebels in Yemen have stepped up attacks after U.S. President Joe Biden removed them from the list of terrorist organizations. Since the White House announcement, the Iranian-trained and funded terrorists have perpetrated drone attacks on neighboring Saudi Arabia almost daily. They have also increased their attacks on targets within Yemen. A spokesperson for the State Department said the decision to revoke their status as a terrorist organization has nothing to do with the administration's view of the Houthis and their reprehensible conduct, including attacks against civilians and the kidnappings of American citizens. The biblical altar of Joshua, located on Mount Ebal, was partially destroyed by the Palestinian Authority during road work in Samaria. The construction crews badly damaged a 3,200-year-old wall surrounding the shrine. News of the destruction spread throughout the Holy Land, sparking outcry and demands that the Israeli government do more to protect biblical sites that are under Palestinian jurisdiction. The Sumerian Regional Council assembled a clandestine task force to enter the area and repair the wall. Restoration professionals were able to rebuild 35 meters of the western wall of the altar compound, but they were unable to reconstruct the northern wall. Yossi Dagan, the chairman of the Samaria Regional Council, decried the damage, saying the altar of Yehoshua ben Nun is not only an important historical site for the Jewish people, it is one of the ironclad assets of world culture. The Israeli Defense Forces Northern Command launched a massive exercise simulating war with Hezbollah in Lebanon. Operation Thunderstorm tested the Israeli Army's preparedness to rapidly respond to attacks on its northern border. 
The exercise, which spanned two days, involved ground troops, the Israeli Navy, cyber defense, the intelligence directorate, and the Israeli police. After participating in Operation Thunderstorm, the Israeli Air Force launched surprise air exercises. Operation Galilee Rose also simulated war with the Hezbollah terror group and its allies in Syria. The massive scope of these drills demonstrates Jerusalem's belief that there will likely be a conflict in the next year with the Iranian-backed Shiite terror group, which possesses more than 190,000 rockets, many of which have been converted into precision-guided missiles. New information has come to light about the assassination of Iran's top nuclear scientist, Mohsen Fakhrizadeh. The Jewish Chronicle has reported that the head of Iran's atomic weapons program was killed in a targeted assassination just outside of Tehran with a one-ton machine gun which was smuggled into the Islamic Republic one piece at a time over an eight-month period. The hyper-accurate automated weapon was so precise that it hit the terrorist 13 times without wounding his wife or any of the 12-man security detail which surrounded him in the convoy. The weapon was mounted on the back of a Nissan truck and was operated remotely by spotters. It was rigged to detonate after the attack in order to destroy evidence. The strike team included 20 Israeli and Iranian nationals who were deployed to the enemy state last March. It's likely that members of the Iranian military were also involved in the assassination. Jerusalem warned the international community of the dangerous work that Fakhrizadeh was doing for Iran. Jacob Nagel, the former national security advisor to Israeli Prime Minister Benjamin Netanyahu, went on record saying the Mossad has documents proving that Fakhrizadeh worked on several nuclear warheads, each one able to cause five Hiroshimas. Researchers at the Hebrew University of Jerusalem have developed a blood test which could replace the need for painful and invasive biopsies. This simple blood analysis is extremely accurate and can report on the exact state and location of a disease without the need of a, for a biopsy. A team led by Professor Nir Friedman and Dr. Ronan Sadeh of the university's Life Sciences Institute and the School of Computer Engineering created the test which allows lab technicians to identify and determine the state of dead cells throughout the body and thus diagnose various conditions including cancers and diseases of the heart and liver. It can also identify specific markers which are unique to each person. This could potentially help doctors to develop personalized treatments for individual patients. The Israel Allies Foundation hosted a conference for their caucuses in Latin America. More than 20 parliamentarians from governments throughout the region participated in the virtual meeting. The online event was opened by Speaker of the Knesset, Yariv Levine, who spoke in Spanish and praised the participants' commitment to strengthening ties between Latin America and Israel. Deputy Mayor of Jerusalem, Fleur Hassan Nahum, addressed the group and highlighted the countries of Guatemala and Honduras for their vocal and bold support of Israel. She also thanked them for moving their embassies to Jerusalem. The Israel Allies Foundation coordinates a network of 50 Israel Allies caucuses in governments around the world. Eleven of them are in Latin America. Leopoldo Martinez, the director of the IAF in Latin America, said when you see 20 legislators from seven different Latin American countries meeting together and talking about the future of Israel and Latin American relations, it speaks to the power of faith-based diplomacy. Jews around the world will celebrate the holiday of Purim this week. This festival commemorates the historic pardoning of the Jews of Persia by King Ahasuerus. Many people draw parallels between the madman Haman who hated the Jews and plotted their annihilation with the leaders of the modern-day Persian Empire, which is Iran. Officials in the rogue Islamic Republic have repeatedly declared their intention to wipe Israel off the map and are feverishly working to obtain the weapons to do so. The story of Purim is written in the biblical book of Esther. It holds the reassuring message in these uncertain times that if we are diligent and faithful, God will find a way to save his people, just as he did in Persia more than 2,000 years ago. We at Israel Now News would like to wish all of our viewers a happy Purim. Hag Purim Sameach.
That concludes the news portion of our show. Stay tuned for Ask the Source with Josh Reinstein. Hello and welcome to Ask the Source. I'm your host, Josh Reinstein, and we're here in our beautiful studio in Jerusalem. My guest today is A.Y. Katzov. He's the founder and director of Heart of Israel. A.Y., thank you for being on the show. Thank you very much, Josh, for having me. Uh, tell our viewers a little about what is Heart of Israel. So the Heart of Israel is something that I founded about six years ago. It gives people from all around the world the opportunity to directly connect with the Heart of Israel, be a part, be a partner, and really be a partner in having a scoop of the earth, of the land, in their uh, hands. You're in a very interesting community, Eish Kodesh. Can you tell us a little about that? <laughs> so uh, you visited there once. It's a little hilltop. And it's actually um, right near the city of Anatot, where Jeremiah, when he was talking about the Jews leaving the land, leaving Israel, and then God comes and says, go ahead and buy a field in Anatot. And Jeremiah looks to God and says, God, you know, you're telling me that oil prices are going down. You want me to invest in oil? The, the, everybody's leaving Anatot. Real estate's going to uh, tank, and you're telling me to invest? And God tells him, but one day the Jews will come back and invest and build and settle the land. And we see that today. Just the other day, we um, signed an agreement to, buy, to build another 15 homes in the same biblical city of Anatot, of Jeremiah. You're also witnessing other prophecies fulfilled before your eyes. You're actually planting the vineyards in, in Anatot once again. Tell us about that. Jeremiah 31. Uh, um, he talks about, thou shalt plant vineyards in the mountains of Samaria. And that is the mountain uh, right there by Anatot. And when we came to plant vineyards, everybody said, no, it's powered bedrock, it won't succeed, it won't grow, plant the olives. And we said, but Jeremiah said, and against all odds, now people, those same people that said they won't grow, they come back and say, you don't understand, because of the hard bedrock, the grapes have to work much harder to look for uh, water and they bring out all the nutrition from the rock and we have the best best wine grapes from these vineyards. Yeah, I can attest to that. My wife loves your wine. <laughs> it's, it's celebrated all over the world uh, how great it actually is. But this is also the fulfillment of the prophecy of the deserts blooming. Uh, how do you see that come to pass in your day-to-day -day work? We live prophecy. We see the deserts blooming right under our eyes. We, I planted the vineyards with my children. I have six children. Tree by tree by tree. We take care of the grapes. We have volunteers from Hayovel that come and they prune the grapes, they harvest, and we make wine just from that vineyard. And people come to me from all over and say, this is amazing wine. And I say, listen, I'm a simple guy. I don't know how to do it, but I feel that we're tasting the prophecies in the bottle. You mentioned Hayovel. It's a Christian organization that comes and helps with the harvest. Well, how does that, uh, what does that mean to you being a religious Jew to have so many Bible-believing Christians coming and helping you actually pick the grapes and make the wine? It's unbelievable. I really, I feel that we're living in the end of days. We're on, on the hilltop right near my home. We planted the vineyards against all odd it's blooming. We needed help to harvest and we weren't able to do it. And all of a sudden, these Christian volunteers come from all over the world. And they're there, nights, days, in the rain, in the sun, volunteering, making um, this prophecy, prophecy come to fruitation. There are also other prophecies that you're seeing uh, unfold before your very eyes. You're involved also in helping with Aliyah. Can you tell us a little about that? Yeah, that's really, I would say, the cherry on top of the whipped cream. It's unbelievable how we um, bring, just like it says in the prophecies, the ten tribes will come back to the land of Israel, where God says to Isaiah, I will tell to the north, um, let them go, and to the south, do not hold them back, for I will bring my sons from afar and my daughters from the ends of the earth on eagle wings. And we bring them from all over, even we just brought the last Jews from South Sudan. We did a special mission where we brought them here, and then it's not enough just to bring them, but we help them um, not just to survive, but to thrive. They get full scholarships to universities, and they settle the land and they become part of Israel, part of, part of the, the, the people here in the land. We're now in the time of coronavirus and usually you would have hundreds of people coming to visit your community and getting involved. How has the coronavirus and all the subsequent lockdowns affected your business and your, and your work? So, Josh, at the beginning it was really hard. We went from having full schedules of groups to zero. 
But then we learn just how in the grapes, when, the, when it's the toughest and the hardest, that's when we're able to bloom. We learned how to actually do this virtually. And people are now partnered from the whole world virtually. They take parts in just like that prophecy from Jeremiah to buy the land. They take parts in leasing land here in Israel and then they get the fruit from that land. And people now from all over the world are connecting to us actually much more than before. Uh, you know, but people who believe in the Bible are very excited about the work you're doing, both Jews and Christians, but there are also a lot of people out there who are saying, you know, being an Asia Kodesh is just making your wine is an impediment to peace. What is your message <laughs> to them? So first of all, I've obviously never been there. Um, and I, I say the reality now, especially now the Abraham Accords, proves more than ever that that is so last century. We are in a new times, in the end of days, we are putting our hand to peace. And we even show um, people now from our region are selling wine to Dubai. And um, it is time for them to wake up, see the reality, and see that, uh, this is a, that this is what creates peace, by settling, by building, by flourishing, by giving opportunities to, for everybody, for the whole Middle Eastern neighborhood. Uh, Asia Kodesh is one of the communities that is working with the government to get full rights and benefits like every other community. Where do things stand right now? Um, things are very tough right now. Um, we're very scared also with a new administration. Um, but, you know, I always say there's an example where you ask um, somebody if the, a cup that's half full or half empty. So the optimistic says it's half full, the pessimistic says it's half empty, the realist says, no, it's exactly half half. We're opportunists. We take that cup and we drink it. We don't have time for philosophical debates. We are there. I have six children who were born in the heart of Israel, in Eish Kodesh. We are growing, we are flourishing, and whoever wants to join, we're inviting them to come and join. Uh, you're originally from America, but you're a, a reserve major in the IDF. You've built strong roots to communities. What does it mean to you being uh, an American Jew, coming to Israel, and, and really living out the Bible? How, how does that make you feel? Again, I grew up in California, as you said. Um, I'm very American. I'm very connected to my American roots. And I remember as a child, I would read the Bible, and I would ask my parents, and I would say, so this is our home. To, we need to come to Israel, America as an American, but Israel is a place for all the Jews. And at 10 years old, I actually moved to Israel by myself and um, been living here. And um, uh, the coming here on the eagle wings is also from the United States and also from Africa and also from Europe and also from the Far East. And that's, I think, the real unity where everybody kind of comes in together. And the Ku Ha'ituch, we call it, the, um, where you take um, the rocks together with the gold and you melt it all together until you get the pure gold. And that's what's happening here in the land. You know, they talk about Aliyah from all over the world and Aliyah is exploding we, from Ethiopia, from Europe, but it seems that from America it's been pretty steady. Do you anticipate more American Jews coming to Israel? My experience is that we are overflowing right now, Aliyah from America. Many, many American, too, ma too much. And they're coming to live in the heart of Israel. And um, they've already understood that you could live in Israel and have quality of life at the same time. Um, I remember when I came here, we'd bring in our suitcase uh, ketchup uh, peanut butter, shampoo, different things that they, weren't, they didn't have in Israel, they didn't have what we're used to. Today, you know you can get everything here in Israel. It says in the Bible, Eretz Shekul a land that everything is here, Lot Tichsar, there's nothing missing here, except for Hershey Kisses, but we'll get there too. <laughs> hey, why well, there are literally millions of people watching this show. What message do you have for our viewing audience? Straight message, come join us, be part of us. You can connect us on our website, you can plant trees with us, um, you could enjoy the fruits of the land. We're here waiting for you. Um, we're putting our hand out to you. We're waiting for you to return our hand and join us. Thank you, Aoi, for being on the show. And thank you for tuning in to Ask the Source. I'm your host, Josh Reinstein. Now back to the studio. Up next, the return to Zion with Karen Hayasod. Shalom and welcome to the Return to Zion with Karen Haisod. I'm Sam Grunwerg, World Chairman of Karen Haisod, the leading official fundraising organization for the State of Israel. 
The story of the Exodus boat is one of Karana Isod's most famous operations. Listen to the first-hand testimony of one of the brave women who fulfilled her biblical destiny by coming home. And as the dark clouds gathered over Europe, the door to the land of Israel was not yet open. Under Arab League pressure, the British ruthlessly restricted Jewish immigration. Karen Hayasod, alongside Jews already in the land of Israel, banded together and launched the clandestine naval operation, codenamed Aliyah Bet, to save their brethren from the clutches of Nazi Germany and bring them to Israel. With careful organization and ingenuity, these brave souls defied the British authorities. Makeshift, rickety boats set sail from ports across Europe, transporting a wretched human cargo of men, women, and children desperately seeking refuge. Upon its arrival to the port of Haifa, the ship was deported back to Europe, thus making it a symbol of the many hardships Jews had to face during the time of Aliyah, immigrating to their historical homeland. Undeterred, the overcrowded, unseaworthy vessels of Ali Abed continued to challenge the blockade. Young Jewish fighters, aided by their non-Jewish sailors, succeeded in bringing more than 70,000 Jews home to the land of their forefathers in more than 100 vessels. עם ישראל צריך להיות כולו בארץ ישראל. זה ראינו בכל הדורות. Those who made it ashore were swiftly smuggled into the future Jewish state by daring activists from Karen Hayasod and elsewhere. Evading capture, the new arrivals were taken to Kibbutzim and other new communities to live as free Jews in their own land, fulfilling the dreams of countless generations before them. Doing so, they brought to life Zechariah's prophecy, not by might and not by power, but by my spirit, saith the Lord. To this day, Karen Hayasod is helping Jews around the world come home with the help of Jews and non-Jews alike. Let's bless Israel together. Now's the time for you to get involved. Assist Karen Hayasod to raise the necessary funds in order to bring Jews yearning for their homeland back to Israel. Your donation can help fulfill the biblical prophecy today. To donate and get information, visit our website at www.khisrael.org. Prime Minister Mitsotakis, my good friend, Kiriakos, welcome back to Israel. You arrived here directly from Cyprus and uh, the three of us, uh, Israel, Greece, and Cyprus, have built up a tremendous trilateral uh, partnership. And I have to say that uh, our bilateral relations have grown. When I say grown, you should know that our 
common trade, uh, security, and technological cooperation went up. We've just discussed uh, a green passport uh, arrangement where Israelis, when we lift the uh, restraints on flights, would be able to go to Greece and without any limitations, no self-isolation, nothing. Uh, and I think this is good news for all of us. Uh, our cooperation is good for our countries. It's good for the entire region. Uh, we have, uh, we have a, a common past. We're very proud of our past and eager to seize the future together. We're two democracies at the edge of the Mediterranean. We have Athens and Jerusalem, as I never tire of saying, are the, you know, are the ones who laid the foundations for uh, our modern Western civilization. Uh, and we, are, we share common aspirations for stability, prosperity, and security. And our cooperation uh, allows us to seize opportunities and energy. We discuss the East Med pipelines with some innovative ideas that Prime Minister Mitsotakis brought. Uh, we're discussing how to augment tourism, as I told you, uh, and how to better meet uh, the challenges that uh, to the security and health of our citizens, including discussing cooperation in COVID. Now, yesterday, I wanted to meet Professor Arbor from Ichilov, and I wanted to meet him because of this miracle drug that has not yet been tested. It's been tested on 30 people and found effective. If you're infected by corona and you're seriously ill and you have a lung problem, you take this, you inhale this, with a saline solution, and you come out feeling good. My friend, uh, Prime Minister Mitsotakis, comes to my office, and more or less the first question he asked me was, can you tell me about this miracle drug? We called uh, Professor Arbor, and uh, Prime Minister Mitsotakis uh, volunteered that Greece, uh, their leading uh, hospital, would partake in the clinical trials, and I hope that uh, we can approve this because I think this is an example of our cooperation. That's all for this edition of Israel Now News. I'm Yochanan El Rome. And I'm Rebecca Rand, reporting from our studio in Jerusalem. Please join us again next week for all of your Israel updates.